Sorry, folk, I'll just hold you up for a moment while uh, they get me a microphone, otherwise I'm tied entirely to this one here. And it's uh, my apology because I should have gone and picked it up and I didn't. But uh, they're going to drop it in for me. <coughs> while I am here in front of this one, I'll uh, just let you know for a moment, those of you who have an interest in the CHIP program, or I have had to do with the CHIP program, which is now going to be called the Complete Health Improvement Program. And uh, <coughs> it uh, has a new face and will be in operation sometime during the year. We've just been down to the conference that established it. So uh, think about it because uh, you'll be disappointed if you don't uh, join a CHIP program at some stage in the next couple of years. It's got a new face, up-to-date, New Zealandized, and you'll, uh, you'll love it, I'm sure. Thank you very much for that. Working for you, is it? Is that okay? All right. So our service today, I've entitled A Hug from Hippo. You have no idea what it's about from that uh, sermon title, do you? But uh, you will find out as we go along. I'll refer you this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew 18. And uh, you know this chapter, many of you, is the chapter where Jesus gives instruction of how to handle situations where uh, people have uh, come short of their expectations in their relationships with other church members or for anybody that they have to do with for that matter. So if you're in Matthew 18 and verse 21, Peter, it says, came up to the Lord and asked, how many times should I forgive someone who does something wrong to me? Is seven times enough? Peter thought he was being pretty generous, I guess. 22, Jesus answered, not just seven times, but 77 times. That's getting a little difficult. This story will show you the kingdom of, what the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus said. One day a king decided to call his officials and ask them to give an account of what they owed him. In those days, pretty much like it is today, I suppose, the king uh, was actually the reserve bank and he dished out as much money as he wanted the society to have. As he was doing this, one official was brought in who owed him 50 million silver coins. And I guess today we might say 50 million dollars. But he didn't have any money to pay what he owed. The king ordered him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he owed in order to pay the debt. The official got down on his knees and he began begging. Have pity on me, he said, and I will pray you, uh, pay you every cent that I owe. What a rash statement. The king felt sorry for him and he let him go free. He even told the official that he didn't have to pay back the money at all. As the official was leaving, he happened to meet another official who had him, 100 silver coins. Work out the ratio between 100 and 50 million, and it's about point, what, 0.01% or something like that or less. Who's a mathematician? You work it out. As the official was leaving, he happened to meet this fellow, owed him 100 silver coins. So he grabbed the man by the throat and he started choking him and he said, pay me what you owe. The man got down on his knees and he began begging. Have pity on me, he says, and I will pay you back. But the first official refused to have pity. Instead, he went and had the other official put in jail until he could pay what he owed. I don't know how you pay it when you're in jail, but there you are. When some other officials found out what had happened, they felt sorry for the man who had been put in jail. And then they told the king what had happened. The king called the first official back in, and he said, you didn't have... Uh, said, you an evil man, when you begged for mercy, I said you didn't have to pay back a cent. Don't you think you should show pity to someone else as I did to you? The king was so angry that he ordered the official to be tortured until he could pay back everything he owed. 
And that is how my Father in heaven, Jesus said, will treat you if you don't forgive each of my followers with all your heart. Many of you know this story pretty well. It's a, a funny sort of a story in a way because it, it places some impossibilities upon these unfortunate people, both of whom owed a debt, both of whom could not pay, and uh, both seemed to have such significant debts that it was an impossibility to even think of paying it back. And uh, if you could read this in, uh, in the Greek, you would see very quickly that Jesus is putting a story forward here that seems impossible. But then some impossible situations arose back in those days because sometimes the Roman um, governors of different parts of the Roman Empire would actually lend out money to individuals and their object was to make that money uh, work for them and they could take a large uh, cut out of it and then they would return the proceeds back to the crown or they would be used in the city in which they lived for public purposes. So it's quite possible that uh, the first man <coughs> was in fact able to borrow $50 million in our today's money. But somehow he had misused it and I suppose he spent it uh, in Las Vegas or some other place that was similar. The money was gone, he couldn't pay it back and of course to obtain $50 million from any other source but the government was an impossibility. That would be just ridiculous. So what did the king do? Uh, the king could say, well you deserve punishment for this and you go into jail for the rest of your life and uh, your wife and your kids will work for the crown for the rest of their lives and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and so on. Um, this is what we call when you make wills a persterpes distribution. If you know what that big uh, uh, Latin word means. It means it goes on and on and on and uh, I suppose the interest would be added and down 2,000 years today there's some unfortunate family that still owes debt to some Roman governor back in Rome. So uh, that's an impossibility. The king looks at it, the uh, emperor looks at it and he says, this is impossible. And he says, I realize that this can happen. I will let you off. He says, I'll let you go free. Forget about it. Forget about the debt. Now you would think that that man would be the happiest man in town or the country for that matter. And I would be pretty happy really if someone had written off some of the debts that, uh, that I had uh, once owed because I had a few bad years in business and at times I owed some money too and at times I had to go to some uh, of my creditors and say I can't pay you this month I'm dividing up what I can pay and you all get forty dollars or whatever it is or a hundred dollars uh, even in, uh, in my younger day when I had a machinery business and so on Bits and pieces for machines were, were pretty expensive in relation to uh, other kinds of businesses. And uh, many of them, all of them for that matter, were, were very generous and very good. And I paid them all off and so on. When I had a good year, of course, um, they were happy that I could come and pay them cash. And that made them uh, a lot happier. So that was good. But uh, I know what it is to have to go and beg for mercy. And uh, so this first man has to beg for mercy and he receives, surprisingly, the mercy that he begs for. Do you know that most people who beg for mercy in something don't anticipate that they will actually be treated mercifully? Did you know that? Statistically, most people who go to ask for something don't believe that they will actually get it. So if you go to social welfare and say, I've got a special need and this is my situation and I need some money, for this, that or the other and, and uh, whatever, most of them don't go there anticipating that they will actually get it. And so uh, social welfare um, gives them the money and they go away as happy as a king. Of course this can become a habit and next month they're back there again because they've started to learn that social welfare is not such a bad thing after all. But uh, <coughs> it's there for a purpose and does a good job. But uh, this man is surprised evidently and he goes away evidently as happy as can be but he meets somebody else who owes him a pittance by comparison but he doesn't have a merciful spirit not like the, his, uh, his king has and uh, he acts in quite a different way and uh, treats this unfortunate lesser servant uh, very severely. And uh, 
the uh, contrast is between the two different attitudes of, the, of these two people. The two people who have the most power is the king and the first servant. They are the ones who have the power. The other lesser servant doesn't have any power at all. All he can do is beg for mercy. He has no power in his situation because there's no one else to appeal to. There's nowhere else to go to. And so the first two have the power, and it's how they exercise that power that is really significant in the story. And uh, Jesus was telling the story because he was answering Peter, who had inquired about how many times he should forgive if someone sinned against him. And uh, Jesus said, 70 times 7. That's four, uh, seven sevens of 49, aren't they? I remember I had difficulty learning that years ago because it doesn't relate to anything else. And, uh, but I learned it when I was about six years old, I think, seven sevens of 49, and you go on with your tables like that, 49 times, and I wonder how many of us, if we put ourselves in Peter's situation and thought, would think 49 is a pretty reasonable figure. Can you really think of 49 uh, offences against you for which you ought to forgive? The chances are you can't. And if I asked you to write these down on a bit of paper, um, even confidentially, you'd probably come up with six or five or nine, maybe 15. That's, uh, that's about it. 49 is a pretty good number. So Peter wasn't doing too bad there, was he? And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, as far as Jesus is concerned, Jesus was pretty generous about it. But of course, Jesus might have been thinking deeper. Jesus may well have been thinking what his attitude, not uh, towards any individual, but towards a whole nation was. Because Jesus knew the figures in the prophecies in, uh, in the book of Daniel for 49, uh, 490 years. Uh, that fits into seven too, doesn't it? And so Jesus is talking about a great number of sevens. He may well have been thinking that he had given the, the Jews, the Jewish people, Israel, 490 extra years to get things right. How many lifetimes is 490 years? If you put 70 into 490, you work it out. If, you, if they live to 70 years old, there was a few generations there who had time to get it right. And the one thing particularly that the Jewish people had to learn to get right was, what was God's attitude towards sinful people? Because in those 490 years, and at the start of that 490 years, something was creeping into Judaism, which was uh, to become a significant problem in, in the church, if you like to call it the church, or in the nation. And that problem was the idea that God was very exacting. In other words, if you owed God $50 million, God wanted $50 million back. And that got established into the uh, Jewish society over a period of that 490 years and became worse and worse. And so when you come to the time of Malachi, for instance, uh, 300 years before Jesus' time, it was well established where people wanted to get their money back, where the Jews believed that God wanted his money back and that if you sinned, God wanted to exact justice on you. And hence they developed all these rules and laws so that they wouldn't sin. And they developed all these hundreds of laws about how you would keep the Sabbath day, about how you would calculate your tithe that you would give to the church. And you'd go out on a Friday afternoon and you'd count the leaves on your mint plant and pick off one out of every ten. And, uh, and uh, that would be your tithe. And they became so particular because they believed that God wanted to exact the last penny out of you. And if you were a sinner, you would therefore have to become perfected, absolutely perfect, otherwise... God had not got everything back from you. And nowhere in the Old Testament does it say that human beings will become perfected like Adam was before he sinned. 
But this was the idea. So everybody became an impossible, an impossible target for God's 